The history of the Jews in Iraq is documented from the time of the Babylonian captivity c. 586 BC. Iraqi Jews constitute one of the world's oldest and most historically significant Jewish communities. The Jewish community of Babylon included Ezra the scribe, whose return to Judea in the late 6th century BC is associated with significant changes in Jewish ritual observance and the rebuilding of the temple. In Jerusalem, the Talmud was compiled in Babylonia, identified with modern Iraq. From the Babylonian period to the rise of the Islamic Caliphate, the Jewish community of Babylon thrived as the center of Jewish learning. The Mongol invasion and Islamic discrimination in the Middle Ages led to its decline. Under the Ottoman Empire, the Jews of Iraq fared better. The community established modern schools in the second half of the 19th century. In the 20th century, Iraqi Jews played an important role in the early days of Iraq's independence. Between 1950-52, 120,000 minus 130,000 of the Iraqi Jewish community were transported to Israel in Operation Ezra and Nehemiah. Early Biblical History In the Bible, Babylon and the country of Babylonia are not always clearly distinguished, in most cases the same word being used for both. In some passages the land of Babylonia is called Shinar, while in the post-exilic literature it is called Chaldi. In the book of Genesis, Babylonia is described as the land in which Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna are located, cities that are declared to have formed the beginning of Nimrod's kingdom. Here, the Tower of Babel was located, and it was also the seat of Amraphel's dominion. In the historical books Babylonia is frequently referred to, though the lack of a clear distinction between the city and the country is sometimes puzzling. Allusions to it are confined to the points of contact between the Israelites and the various Babylonian kings especially Meridak Baladan and Nebuchadnezzar. In books of Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah the interest is transferred to Cyrus, though the retrospect still deals with the conquest of Nebuchadnezzar, and Artaxerxes is mentioned once. In the poetical literature of Israel, Babylonia plays an insignificant part, but it fills a very large place in the prophets. The book of Isaiah resounds with the burden of Babylon, though at that time it still seemed a far country. In the number and importance of its references to Babylonian life and history, the book of Jeremiah stands preeminent in the Hebrew literature, with numerous important allusions to events in the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Jeremiah has become a valuable source in reconstructing Babylonian history within recent times. The inscriptions of Nebuchadnezzar are almost exclusively devoted to building operations, and but for the book of Jeremiah, little would be known of his campaign against Jerusalem. Late Biblical History and the Babylonian Exile Three times during the 6th century BC, the Jews of the ancient kingdom of Judah were exiled to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. These three separate occasions are mentioned. The first was in the time of Jehoiachin in 597 BC, when, in retaliation for a refusal to pay tribute, the Temple of Jerusalem was partially despoiled and a number of the leading citizens removed. After eleven years, in the reign of Zedekiah, who had been enthroned by Nebuchadnezzar, a fresh revolt of the Judeans took place, perhaps encouraged by the close proximity of the Egyptian army. The city was razed to the ground, and a further deportation ensued. Finally, five years later, Jeremiah records the third captivity. After the overthrow of Babylonia by the Persians, Cyrus gave the Jews permission to return to their native land, and more than 40,000 are said to have availed themselves of the privilege. The earliest accounts of the Jews' exile to Babylonia are furnished only by scanty biblical details. Certain sources seek to supply this deficiency from the realms of legend and tradition. Thus, the so-called small chronicle endeavors to preserve historic continuity by providing a genealogy of the exilics back to King Jeconiah. Indeed, Jeconiah himself is made an exilic. 
The small chronicles statement that Zerubbabel returned to Judea in the Greek period can of course not be regarded as historical. Certainly, the descendants of the Davidic line occupied an exalted position among their brethren in Babylonia as they did at that period in Judea. During the Maccabean Revolt, these Judean descendants of the royal house had immigrated to Babylonia. Greek period. With Alexander the Great's campaign, accurate information concerning the Jews in the East reached the Western world. Alexander's army contained numerous Jews who refused, from religious scruples, to take part in the reconstruction of the destroyed Belus Temple in Babylon. The accession of Seleucus Nicator, 312 BC, to whose extensive empire Babylonia belonged, was accepted by the Jews and Syrians for many centuries as the commencement of a new era for reckoning time, called Minyan Sheterat, Ere Contractuum, or Era of Contracts, which was also officially adopted by the Parthians. This so-called Seleucid era survived in the Orient long after it had been abolished in the West. Nicator's foundation of a city, Seleucia, on the Tigris is mentioned by the rabbis both at large and the small chronicle contain references to him. The important victory which the Jews are said to have gained over the Galatians in Babylonia must have happened under Seleucus Callinicus or under Antiochus III. The last named settled a large number of Babylonian Jews as colonists in his western dominions, with the view of checking certain revolutionary tendencies disturbing those lands. Mithridates subjugated, about the year 160, the province of Babylonia, and thus the Jews for four centuries came under Parthian domination. Parthian period Jewish sources contain no mention of Parthian influence. The very name Parthian does not occur, unless indeed Parthian is meant by Persian, which occurs now and then. The Armenian prince Sanitrosis, of the royal house of the Arsacides, is mentioned in the small chronicle as one of the successors of Alexander. Among other Asiatic princes, the Roman rescript in favor of the Jews reached Arsaces as well. It is not, however, specified which Arsaces. Not long after this, the Partho-Babylonian country was trodden by the army of a Jewish prince. The Syrian king, Antiochus VII side Tess, marched, in company with Hyrcanus I, against the Parthians, and when the allied armies defeated the Parthians at the Great Zab, the king ordered a halt of two days on account of the Jewish Sabbath and Feast of Weeks. In 40 BC, the Jewish puppet king, Hyrcanus II, fell into the hands of the Parthians, who, according to their custom, cut off his ears in order to render him unfit for rulership. The Jews of Babylonia, it seems, had the intention of founding a high priesthood for the exiled Hyrcanus, which they would have made quite independent of Judea, but the reverse was to come about. The Judeans received a Babylonian, Ananel by name, as their high priest which indicates the importance enjoyed by the Jews of Babylonia. Still in religious matters the Babylonians, as indeed the whole diaspora, were in many regards dependent upon Judea. They went on pilgrimages to Jerusalem for the festivals. How free a hand the Parthians permitted the Jews is perhaps best illustrated by the rise of the little Jewish robber state in Nehardi. Still more remarkable is the conversion of the king of Adiabene to Judaism. These instances show not only the tolerance, but the weakness of the Parthian kings. The Babylonian Jews wanted to fight in common cause with their Judean brethren against Vespasian, but it was not until the Romans waged war under Trajan against Parthia that they made their hatred felt, so that it was in a great measure owing to the revolt of the Babylonian Jews that the Romans did not become masters of Babylonia too. Philo speaks of the large number of Jews resident in that country, a population which was no doubt considerably swelled by new immigrants after the destruction of Jerusalem, accustomed in Jerusalem from early times to look to the east for help, and aware, as the Roman procurator Petronius was, that the Jews of Babylon could render effectual assistance, Babylonia became with the fall of Jerusalem the very bulwark of Judaism.
The collapse of the Bar Kochba revolt no doubt added to the number of Jewish refugees in Babylon. In the continuous Roman-Persian wars, the Jews had every reason to hate the Romans, the destroyers of their sanctuary, and to side with the Parthians, the protectors. Possibly it was recognition of services thus rendered by the Jews of Babylonia, and by the Davidic house especially, that induced the Parthian kings to elevate the princes of the exile, who until then had been little more than mere collectors of revenue, to the dignity of real princes, called Rishkaluta. Thus then, the numerous Jewish subjects were provided with a central authority which assured an undisturbed development of their own internal affairs. Babylonia as the center of Judaism. After the fall of Jerusalem, Babylon would become the focus of Judaism for more than a thousand years, and the place where Jews would acclimate themselves as a people without a land. The Jews of Babylon would even for the first time write prayers in a language other than Hebrew, such as the Kaddish, written in Judeo-Aramaic, a harbinger of the many languages in which Jewish prayers in the diaspora would come to be written in, such as Greek, Arabic, and Turkish. The Rabbi Abba Arika, known as Rab due to his status as the highest authority in Judaism, is considered by the Jewish oral tradition the key leader, who along with the whole people in diaspora, maintained Judaism after the destruction of Jerusalem. After studying in Palestine at the Academy of Judaism, Rab quietly returned to his Babylonian home, his arrival in the year 530 of the Seleucidan, or 219 of the Common Era, is considered to mark the beginning of a new era for the Jewish people. Rab's career is seen as initiating the dominant role that the Babylonian academies played for several centuries, for the first time outmoding Judea and Galilee in the quality of Torah study. Most Jews to this day rely on the quality of the work of Babylon during this period over that of the Galilee from the same period. The Jewish community of Babylon was already learned, Rab just focused and organized their study leaving an existing Babylonian academy at Nehadi for his colleague Samuel, Rab founded a new academy at Surah, where he and his family already owned property, and which was known as a Jewish city. Rab's move created an environment in which Babylon had two contemporary leading academies that competed with one another, yet were so far removed from one another that they could never interfere with each other's operations. Since Rab and Samuel were acknowledged peers in position and learning, their academies likewise were accounted of equal rank and influence. Their relationship can be compared to that between the Judea Galilee and Eudmi province academies of the House of Hillel Harzakan and the House of Shami, albeit Rab and Samuel agreed far more often than did the houses of Hillel and Shammai, who nearly never agreed on the law. Thus both Babylonian rabbinical schools opened this new era for diaspora Judaism well, and the ensuing discussions in their classes furnished the earliest stratum in style of the scholarly material deposited in the Babylonian Talmud. The coexistence for many decades of these two colleges of equal rank, even after the school at Nehadi was moved to Pumbedita produced for the first time in Babylonia the phenomenon of dual leadership that, with some slight interruptions, became a permanent fixture and a weighty factor in the development of the Jewish faith as we know it today. The key work of these semi-competing academies was the compilation of the Babylonian Talmud, completed by Rav Ashi and Ravina, two successive leaders of the Babylonian Jewish community, around the year 520. Though roughly copies had already been circulated to the Jews of the Byzantine Empire, editorial work by the Savere Moriban and Savere continued on this text's grammar for the next 250 years. Much of the text did not reach its perfected form until around 600-700 ad. The Mishnah, which had been completed in the early 3rd century AD, and the Babylonian Gemara together to form the Talmud Bavli, the three centuries in the course of which the Babylonian Talmud was developed and the academies founded by Rab and Samuel were followed by five centuries during which it was intensely preserved. 
studied, expounded in the schools, and, through their influence, discipline and work, recognized by the whole diaspora. Sura and Pumbedita were considered the seats of diaspora learning. Their heads and sages were the weighty authorities whose decisions were sought from all sides and were accepted wherever diaspora Jewish communal life existed. They even successfully competed against the learning coming from the Roman provinces of the mythologized land of Israel itself. In the words of the Haggadist, God created these two academies in order that the promise might be fulfilled, that the word of God should never depart from Israel's mouth. The periods of Jewish history immediately following the close of the Talmud are designated according to the titles of the teachers at Surah and Pumbedita. Thus we have the time of the Geonim and that of the Sabaraim. The Sabaraim were the scholars whose diligent hands completed the Talmud and the first great Talmudist commentaries in the first third of the sixth century. The two academies among others, and the Jewish community they lead, lasted until the middle of the 11th century. Pumbedita faded after its chief rabbi was murdered in 1038, and Sura faded soon after, which ended for centuries the great scholarly reputation given to Babylonian Jews as the center of Jewish thought. Sassanid period. The Persian people were now again to make their influence felt in the history of the world. Ardashir I destroyed the rule of the Arsacids in the winter of 226 and founded the illustrious dynasty of the Sassanids. Different from the Parthian rulers, who were northern Iranians following Mithraism and Zoroastrianism and speaking Pahlavi dialect, the Sassanids intensified nationalism and established a state-sponsored Zoroastrian church which often suppressed dissident factions and heterodox views. Under the Sassanids, Babylonia became the province of Ashuristan, with its main city, Cte Siphon, becoming the capital of the Sassanid Empire. Shapur I was a friend to the Jews. His friendship with Shmuel gained many advantages for the Jewish community. Shapur II's mother was Jewish, and this gave the Jewish community a relative freedom of religion and many advantages. Shapur was also the friend of a Babylonian rabbi in the Talmud called Rabbah, and Rabbah's friendship with Shapur II enabled him to secure a relaxation of the oppressive laws enacted against the Jews in the Persian Empire. In addition, Rabbah sometimes referred to his top student Abbe with the term Shver Malka meaning Shapur, the king, because of his bright and quick intellect. Christians, Manichaeans, Buddhists and Jews at first seemed at a disadvantage, especially under Sasanian high priest Cartier, but the Jews, dwelling in more compact masses in cities like Isfahan, were not exposed to such general discrimination as broke out against the more isolated Christians.